I am Brother Shelley, and I'd like to welcome you to Life Application. And this is where practical teaching gives birth to the demonstrations of God's Word. Today we'd like to continue our teaching out of the book of Romans, and we're teaching a subject called Practical Christianity. And through this text and through this teaching, we have been discovering Paul's actual teaching on our duty as believers, or our Better yet, our obligation as a believer of God, how we should walk and how we should maintain ourselves. So if you just stick with us and we're going to continue in this teaching, I'm going to bag up and, and pick us up in a way that we may understand where I'm going to today. But it's a basic continuation from where we were. I'm actually going to give you a, I'm going to give you the points where we started, where we're supposed to start from. And I'm going to give you an idea where we came from. So if you don't mind, if you bow your heads and we'll have prayer and then we'll get started. Father and I, God, we just thank you for this time that you've allowed us to come and study this, your word. Lord, we just thank you for the many blessings that you bestowed upon this, your people. And most of all, I pray a special blessing over the, the people, the workers in this land, Father, that's, that's, that's working diligently through, techn through technology that's continually getting the word of God out. I thank you for allowing us this opportunity to still preach and teach this, your word. Now, I pray a special blessing over the people that's, that's in the field, that's, that's working in the, in, the ministry, in, in the media departments and all over the world that's actually helping getting this word out. I pray that you touch them and touch their hearts and put a special blessing over their hearts. Now, as we begin to study this, your word, Father, I pray that your spirit is with us. I pray you enlighten our hearts and our minds and, and, and most of all, just, just stir us up so that we may be a better people than we were yesterday. We pray this word reaches and touches the hearts and the souls of the believer that we may be the practical Christian that you called us to be. We give you all praise. We give you all glory and honor. And we thank you for what you have done. And we thank you for what you're about to do. So it's in Jesus' name we ask it all. Let every heart say amen. We have been dealing with the subject out of, the t out of Romans chapter 12, verses 9 through 21, that we call practical Christianity. Practical Christianity. Romans chapter 12 actually begins with Paul's discussion of practical application of gospel in the life of a Christian. So we started moving in that particular area, and we actually, our core group of textures or scriptures that we've been dealing with has been actually Romans 12, verses 9 through 13. This particular section was called a brother in the family. And in verses 10 through 13, focuses on the duty to the family of God. Now, here's where we're at. We actually have moved from verse 9 into verse 10, and we are actually dealing with what Paul declares in verse 10. He says, be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. Now, we discussed that verse 10 was actually divided into two particular areas, and we looked into those areas, and we dealt with two powerful words out of the text. We looked at honor, and we looked at preference. Now, we talked about honor means giving preference to one another, and then we talked about preference means to go before or to lead uh, or, or, to, or to set an example. Now, those words are still going to be perfectly important to us because as believers, we're still to actually give honor to each other, and we're actually to show preference. When we talked about showing preference, remember we said to go before or to lead or to set an example. Christians ought to be the example setters in the kingdom of God. Now, the charge was clear that Paul had given us. The believer is to take the lead in esteeming and expressing respect for others. And the idea was to count others before you. When we say count others before you, we mean putting others first. Now, we said we put our brethren first was the foreground what we was looking at. And we said this teaches us that real Christian affection is selfless. If you say you have Christian affection, if you're living in a Christian life, a love life, it is selfless. It's not about you. It's selfless. Now, Scripture encourages us to put others first. 1 Corinthians 10 and 24 actually starts us off in that direction. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, let no one seek his own, but each one other's well-being. Let no one seek his own, but each other's well-being. Now, in that particular text, or, or what, what he's actually saying was this. He's laying it out in a way that we should, that's, 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 
I want you to hear, his, hear how he did it and what's going on here. He says, let no one seek his own. It means we are never to seek our own well-being or we're never to actually seek the benefit of ourselves. What he's actually doing or what Paul is actually writing, what he wants us to understand is this. He says, let no one seek his own, but each one of the other's well-being it is dealing with giving God glory. See, though we have, you know, though we got the freedom to do what we want to and to and to and to be the best or to get what we want and to look others down. The text is actually teaching us what we're to do is we're actually the, the, our duty first is to put others first. The duty of a Christian is to put others first. We're to actually look beyond ourselves and help others. So he says, although we have the freedom, we have the responsibility to go for ourselves, our duty is to seek the well-being of others. And in that, we are giving glory to God when we do that. Then he moves along further and he says in 1 Corinthians 13 and 5, he says something totally different. 1 Corinthians 13 and 5, he says, he does, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and thinks no evil. Now, here he's actually talking about love, the brotherly love again. This love, he says, does not behave rudely. Now, when you talk about behaving rudely, this means it does not dishonor or it does not disrespect. A uh, Christian brotherly love, it doesn't dishonor people, it doesn't disrespect people. And he's teaching us in that text. Then he moves along, he says, and it does not behave rudely. This means it does not dishonor and it doesn't disrespect. You think about this. It doesn't behave rudely is what he's thinking, what he's talking about. Now, behaving rudely is actually an attitude issue of believers or how we, how we deal with people, how we get along or interact with others. If we're born again and we're believers, he says, our Christian love should not allow us. Now, I'm saying it shouldn't allow us to behave rudely, and, 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 and that's one of the issues. It means this is control, or it's talking about self-control and how we have to control ourselves and watch ourselves. It says this right here. It, 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 it just means that we don't, we don't allow emotions to take over because we control our emotions. Because remember, we talked about love is basically of the will, and since we have control of our will, we're in control of that emotion. So we're to teach ourselves and we're to work with ourselves through the power of the Holy Spirit not to allow these things to happen to us. So first we said we're not to behave, not to behave rudely. And then it says it does not seek its own. It does not seek its own. And it, now, it does not seek its own is something a little bit different, but I need you to hear what it says. Does not seek its own mean is self-seeking means selfishness. Love is not selfish. Love is not about you. Love is actually something that you give and extend, but it's never about you. And what we do is, this text of Scripture, what he's telling us in Corinthians, he said, if you are a selfish person, then you're not operating in love. Brotherly love is not selfish. And we understand when he says selfish, I need you to hear a quick example of what I'm talking about. When you're worried all about me and not worried about your fellow man or your brother that needs help. When you can, and, 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 and we're in a point of time in life right now, what it, I'm going to show you exactly what it means. Selfishness is when you don't want to ma don't want to wear a mask, but you're going around people and infecting them. That's selfishness. When you, when you can go in public and not, because see, we all understand the mask is for you, not for others, not to pass your germs to someone else. Selfish is when I don't want to wear it, but you're spreading your germs everywhere. Selfish is a person that go to the buffet table at a restaurant and start picking the food out eating it. That's the person who takes the corn chip and keep eating out of the dip instead of getting some sitting down. Y'all see the mic try to cut out when I was talking about some of y'all, because I know you're going to be doing that this week right there. But it's saying selfishness. Basically, selfishness is one of the evils that, that we have to learn to deal with just all across the board. Because that selfish attitude is what basically what, what that evil is born out of. It says we have to learn to not to just, just to, 
just not to seek our own, not to be worried about me, me, me all the times. Everything is no problem as long as I'm doing it, but I'm not worried about who I may affect and what I do. And even when I say it about the mass, just think about those who go out and then come back home and infect their family because they wouldn't wear a mask. And now families are infected by selfish act of someone else. Now, don't get it wrong. There are times when things have happened, and, and it happens to people, but what we're talking about here is just selfish acts, just being selfish, operating selfishly, drinking all the Kool-Aid up, and then put the jug back with a dream in it. That's selfish. That's just, that's just totally out of control. But then he moves along and says, does not seek his own, but then listen to what he said, and is not provoked. Is not provoked. Now, is not provoked or not easily provoked, not easily angered. It means it's not easily angered. People with tempers and attitudes that are easily angered can fly off can go from zero to 9,000 in 1.2 seconds. These are the people we're talking about now. You can get upset at the drop of a hat. Matter of fact, everything upsets you. You can, get, you can be mad about the color, the carpet in the church, or the way a person parked them better than that. We understand a lot of people get mad at where you're sitting at in the church. I've been sitting here 15 years, and now you're going to sit here, and the whole week you'll never hear the sermon because you're upset. Yeah. And believe it or not, there are people that know when you can get upset that easy, and they take advantage of it and push those buttons. So it says, love this type of love that he says, this negative effect of love, it says, it does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, and most of all, it thinks no evil. Now, thinks no evil, it's going to get deep on that one because you have to look at what I'm talking about here. When I say thinks no evil, I mean it doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It doesn't keep record of wrongs. You know, when you, you know, there's people out here when, when you do something or, you know, you all have a disagreement, some people actually hold that grudge forever. Basically, that falls up under forgiveness, but it means keeps no record of wrong. People will say, I'm going to remember you did that to me. It's people that can just holding on to grudges that's been happening to them 50 years ago, and they're still mad about it. And that basically falls under forgiveness, but it means holding on to grudges, unforgiveness, just won't let things go, won't move on from a situation. And, and the issue is, is the person that you, you're holding this grudge against, most of the time they don't even, they don't even know you're still mad. And a lot of them don't, don't, don't really don't care. you mad and they walk around here singing zippity doo dah and you walk around mad, and, and think about it is, it alters your attitude, and it alters the way that you operate. Yeah. So it says, make sure, it says, love doesn't do that. Love does not think on evil. It doesn't hold records. Yeah. So if you have an issue with any of these, then you got to recheck your love. Yeah. Because love ain't going to be rude. Love ain't going to be selfish. Love is not angry. And most of all, it doesn't hold a tally sheet. It doesn't write down every time you do something wrong, I'm going to record it so I can throw it back up at you or I can use it to, to walk in hate. That's not love. That's not love. That's, that's what he's telling us. We're not walking in love that way. Then he moves to our last text of scripture out of that particular set. And he says, not only that, in Philippians 2 and 4, he gives us this, this particular writing. In Philippians 2 and 4, it says this. It says, let each of you look, look out not only for his own interest, but also for the interests of others. Now, when I looked at that, and I, I was kind of looking at this text of Scripture, and I was kind of breaking it down, kind of looking at what the, what the writer was actually saying, and, and it's actually deeper than what it actually reads. See, we look at it and say, let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but he's actually saying something else. He's talking about humility now. Being humble, being, being a humble person. And, it, and it's not one that, that thinks merely less of himself but he just it's a person that doesn't think of himself at all Amen. he's actually saying is that type of person doesn't look out for his own interest because he's not worried about himself he'll spend his whole day he'll spend his whole time he'll spend his whole mission worried about others that's the type of person that he's talking about he says and, and but don't get it wrong listen to this 
The key word out of this is basically others. See, others is the key in this particular text. Listen to what it says, of others. See, the believer's eyes are turned away from himself and focused on the need of others. It's focused on the need of others. Now, in Romans 5, one, Romans 15, 1 and 2, it basically just reaffirms what we're talking about. I'm not going to put it up on the screen. If you want to actually look it up and read it, you can. But it basically says this. It says, we then, who are strong, ought to bear the, bear the scruples of the weak and not to place ourselves, not to please ourselves. And it says, let each of us please his neighbor for his good leading, good leading to edification. He's saying what we're to do is not to look to yourself, to help others, to help bring others into the kingdom of God. See, we're doing this, we're, we're living this lifestyle because we're an example to others and bringing others into the kingdom. That's what he's basically trying to get us to understand. So that's the whole process of what he's dealing with. But then this is where he moves into. He says, now when we do all of this, when we follow these steps and walk this way, what we do, we are actually recognizing and honoring God's gifts in a brother. When you walk this way, when you talk this way, and when you start to live like that, recognizing through love, not putting others, putting others before you, not being selfish, he says you're recognizing and honoring what God does in others. Now, it's only those who, 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 who love, of, who the love of, of, with the love of Christ constrains to love not only themselves or who are capable of thoroughly acting in the spirit of this precept concept is what he's talking about is this he says only when you're operating with the power of the spirit with God in you can you actually even walk this particular way watch what he's doing I got a text of scripture I want you to follow me on 2 Corinthians 5 we're gonna look at verses 14 and 15 watch what it says in 14 14 says for the love of Christ compels us because we judge thus that if one died for all then all die. And he died for all that those who live should live no longer for themselves, but for him who died for them and rose again. That is a mouthful, but you got to listen to what he's talking about. He's actually dealing with where we started out. We're talking about the love of Christ. And this love of Christ, or, 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 or this love of Christ that I'm talking about, was this love that came from the cross where Jesus actually made the substitutionary death on the cross because of his love for, for people. He died on the cross and he's given us his love, but not just given us love. He's given us love with the mandate or motivation to share that type of love. He says what he's doing is he's showing us because of the way he died in his love, we are now to live and walk in that same type of love. So that love was sacrificial. That means that love meant to put all forth. So when you talk about the love of Christ, we're actually talking about a sacrificial love, a love that put others before yourself. So he says a Christian should actually be putting others in front of himself. Now, God fixed this system and he understood what he was doing because he said, if I can get you to show love to others and not worry about yourself, then I can get the people to love you and not worry about themselves, then love will conquer all. Amen. He said, that's how it will work. I, see, don't worry about yourself. Worry about your brother man. Then your brother worry about you. Your bro this brother worry about them. And through that family, we're all connected and we would all love each other. So he, he designed it in a way that it, that, it, that it actually can't fail. It's no way it can go wrong. See, this love of Christ that he's talking about is perfect. It was perfect in the way it worked. So as we continue our discussion concerning our personal duty as members in the family of God, the apostle Paul declares in Romans 12, 11, these words, not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. He's actually telling us in verse 11, he's now giving us pretty much instructional list on where we should be moving to or what we should be doing. He says we're not to be lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, and serving the Lord. Now, this is a strong connection between what Paul has already said to what he's actually declaring in verse 11. What Paul is doing now, he's doubling down on his teaching. 
He's teaching us the same thing over, but he's showing us in a different light. He's basically just reconnecting what he's already taught us or what he's already brought us from. Listen to what he's doing or listen how it's, how it's going here. In verse 10a, he said, be devoted in brotherly love. Have devotion in brotherly love. In other words, he says, have a diligence to your brothers. The love that you have for one another, he said, be diligent in that love. Be devoted in that love. Let nothing steer you away from that type of love. But then he says in verse 10b, he says to prefer one another in honor. Remember, he says, honoring now. He says, honoring love. Have a, have a preferred love. Have an honoring love to your brethren. He says, we have to actually love that way. Now, that same honoring and that same pre preference of love means the same as not lagging in diligence. But watch where I'm going. In verse 11, he continues his discussion by telling us how Christians are to discharge their duties. He's now telling us how we are to discharge our duties. Now, if you remember from the start, we were talking about personal duties of a believer. Every Christian has duties. You were born again. You are not born again to sit on the bench. You are not the 13th man. You have a starting position you have to operate in. See, we get, we get born again, and then we like to sit on the pew and just come every week, listen to them sing. You notice what I'm saying? Listen to the choir sing, and then we get up and leave. We don't participate in worship service. And, 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 I, and I heard something the other day, and it struck me as real, as real clever. James, Peter, John, Moses, all of their work was written about, but everybody's work matter. No matter what you do, it matters. If you are the janitor, it matters. If you are the usher, it matters. If you are a parking attendant, it matters. God gifts you to do what he does, and it matters to the kingdom. Don't let nobody lessen what you do. Don't think because no story was written about a lot of people in the Bible that they didn't have an impact. Scripture teaches us, it says, it could not write about everything in the book or it would be too big. So what you do does matter. So he wants us to understand we have to continue to grow and to be an active member in the church. It's, it's, it's amazing that, we, that we've got so used to coming in and we can sit through a service and just basically be there all through service and then just get up and leave with, and hadn't got up, hadn't shouted. And a lot of us don't even bow our heads when time come to pray. And it's amazing, and I can say that because I've been in the media department, I've looked at the tapes and I've looked at the camera when the camera's on the crowd doing prayer and I'm looking at people passing notes Passing letters, talking, eating, laughing, having fun. Yeah. So they won't even join corporate prayer. We're not bashing. I'm not bashing. I'm not bashing you. What I'm saying is your participation is required. Yeah. God needs your participation. It may be that extra voice in the song to help reach the gates of heaven. Yeah. It may be your prayer that may remove a disease. So what we have to do is, he, Paul says, this list that he's giving us, he actually wants us to start walking and doing. And these are practical things. See, it's nothing super special. It's nothing, you know, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to do. Practical Christianity means everyday things that you can do as a believer. And he's showing us these things that we should do. And then he said here, he said he continues his discussion by telling us how Christians are to discharge their duties. In verse 11, he starts with addressing us about spiritual fervor. Spiritual fervor. In other words, in verse 11, he talks directly of our spiritual zeal for God. Our zeal for God. Our, and, and, and you can look at a zeal and related to hunger and thirst. It's an appetite. It's an attitude. It's a, it's a mindset for God. He says, we have to start right there. You have to fall in love with God, stay in love with God, and be with God. Amen. We have a zeal for people that we don't have for God. 
You love, we have a zeal for friendship. We'll have a zeal for a husband, we'll zeal for wife, but we won't have a zeal for God. And Paul says, we got to start by recapturing that zeal for God. Most of us, when we were born again, we had that zeal because when the doors opened, we were here. Every time, every program came, we were here. We sang, we stood up, we clapped our hands, we raised holy hands. We did everything, but we lost our zeal. And when you lose your zeal, next, your appetite goes away. Remember, I said your hunger and thirst you ever seen a person when they get sick, when they lose their appetite, and then they start to lose weight? We're losing spiritual weight. We're dropping off. We, we don't have the spiritual weight that we once had when we actually came to the kingdom of God. So he says, first and foremost, we must, we got to address and deal with our spiritual fervor. So here's the thing. First thing that we notice in verse 11 is that there are three phases found in it. First thing we found, there are three phases found in it. They must be dealt with individually in their complete meaning, and yet together they express a spiritual zeal for God towards other Christians in the rendering of service. So what he's saying is each one of these areas we're going to look at is separate within itself, but all together it combines and brings us to where we're supposed to be. See, that's making the total Christian, the total Christian man is what he's trying to talk about. He's trying to give us what we need to do, and he's doing it because he's, going to, he's showing us how to express our spiritual zeal for God and towards other Christians. And rendering service. Keyword, rendering service. Do you understand? As believers, we have to give back to God. We give him praise. We give him honor. We give him glory. We pay tithes, but we give him praise and worship. We give him honor. We give him his glory. That's due him. So we think that because you paid your tithe or you gave or you gave a gift, that's fine. That's good. That's spiritual. That's spiritually great. But what have you gave God? When you fail to praise and worship him, that means you have a lack given him. And if you came into service and listened to his word, that means you took something and didn't leave nothing. Amen. You came in service. You took the word that he's passed out for us to prosper our lives, but you didn't worship him. You didn't praise him. And one of the bad reasons why is because we're not here. Amen. A lot of us think it's cool to come in at certain times of, certain times of service. We, we, we drag in when we want to drag in and we don't, you know, we don't participate. We don't get a chance to participate in praise and worship. We come in right when the pastor is taking his text. Well, that makes you a taker. Amen. You came in taking, but you wasn't here to give God praise and worship. Yeah. I'm a firm believer. If we worship and praise God, prayers will be answered. If you don't believe it, you need to check with the media department and buy this tape that we had called Praise Your Way Through. Yeah. Talking about when you're in the midst of a storm, how you praise God, not how you pay tithes, how you praise God and then God, get, God answers prayers. Yeah. How it teaches us how we praise him when we get through with the prayer because we believe that the prayer is already answered. Now, we ain't going to go there because that's a whole nother teaching, but I, I, I just want to give you a quick synopsis of where you need to be. So, first Paul declares this. He says, not lagging in diligence. I want you to see that. It says, not lagging in diligence. Now, I need you to look at it because we're going to look at different versions of this for you to get a true grasp of what I'm talking about. Let's take a look at other translations in this phrase. The King James Version starts us off. The King James says, not slothful in business. The King James Version says, not slothful in business. Romans chapter 12, verse 11a. Then the NIV says, never be lacking in zeal. Never be lacking in zeal. The Living Bible says, never be lazy in your work. Never, never be lazy in your work. Now, that text of scripture right there or that particular point right there 
it's real deep because it, 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 it actually tells you something that you're going to see in the first place. But it says never be lazy in your work. That means not, on, not your job work, but it means in your total life in what you do. And heaven forbid we talk about lazy in your work in the kingdom of God. Lazy singers, lazy musicians, lazy deacons, lazy ushers, lazy ministers. It can go on and on. It says not to do that. Never be lazy in that area. Whatever you do, you should have zeal in it. You should, you should be, it should, it should bother you when you can't do the things that you know God called you to do. You should have a hunger and thirst and be asking, actually asking to do things instead of waiting on things to come to you. The New Revised Standard says this. It says, do not lag in zeal. Do not lag in zeal. Now, let's go back to the beginning. In our text of scripture, we, we, we said not lagging in diligence. And we're talking about the New King James Version now. And this is where we're at. The word diligence as used in this New King James Version means or refers to whether believers do in their supernatural living. Listen, the word diligence as used in the New King James Version means or refers to whatever believers do in their supernatural living. Keywords, whatever they do. Don't. Don't just say whatever they do in the kingdom, whatever they do in church, whatever they do on their job. It says whatever you do, wherever you are. Mm. You want to know why? And I'm going to get there in a minute. But listen what it's saying. The point is this. Whatever is worth doing in the Lord's service is worth doing with enthusiasm and care. Whatever you do, no matter what it is, I just got through saying it. If you are a usher, be the top-notch usher. Be the one that when they come to the door, stop them in the door like this. And I already know where you're going to take them to following directions of the service. Never bringing them down the middle aisle causing disruptions. Taking them out past the walls. Finding seats, being telling people to scoot over or come forward. Having that zeal and that boldness to do that job. See, that zeal gives you that, when you have that zeal and that fervor to do it, that means you will have the boldness to do it. Amen. In other words, you won't, it, you won't, you, you're not afraid because the power of the Holy Spirit is in you, so you don't mind doing it. You won't, you'll tell people, you don't come in the door. You'll stop them at the door and direct them to the walls which they were instructed to do. If you're going to see with your friends, you should have came here early. Now you have to follow what we said do. Oh, don't, don't get it wrong, don't get it wrong. I'm not picking on ushers. I'm sorry if, if I touched some of y'all the wrong way. If y'all were here, I know y'all would be looking at me funny. But I'm finally leave you alone now because I'm going to step into the choir section now. Coming on time and being in position so when time comes to sing, everybody's here. Yeah. Instead of waiting until the song is over with, then easing up there after the first song is over. Because you didn't want to come early for what reason or another. But you can find your way on your job on time, most of us anyway. Yeah. It's got some of us are, are, are perpetually late on our job also. I give them, the, I give them credit with credit due. But it says, whatever you do, and then let's hear the thing. It says, What's, whatever is worth doing in the Lord's service. That means all, all things that you're declaring to God, when you're doing work and you're doing it for the God, you'll do it totally different than you would do it for man. And what he's saying is, if it's worth doing for God, do it the best. Use your best. Yes. And now he's going to flip it and he's taking it another section further because he says this, not only do it good in the kingdom of God, do it in your total life walk. Yeah. If you are a worker, be the best worker on the scene. Yeah. I don't care what the job is. You do the work like the Lord is your boss. You stand there, and, and I don't care what others do. I don't care what other, other people working with you do, what they say about you. All you're doing is representing the kingdom of God. You're representing God. You want God's blessing. You want God's, you want God's protection over you, so you actually carry yourself in a way that's pleasing to God. Amen. 
See, I'm a Christian. I don't care where I am or what I'm doing. I'm a Christian, so that I'm required to work like a Christian, talk like a Christian, walk like a Christian, because I'm representing the kingdom of God no matter where I am. And if you go back to where we were earlier in the text and we were talking about it, he says these walks or these talks that he's getting us to, to, to get used to doing, that's just a representation of who you are. If you say you belong to a child, if you say you are a child of God, I belong to the kingdom of Christ, then you are expected to walk that way and not be a lazy, lazy member of the kingdom of God. Amen. Not be a, not be a, not be the, the member that, 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 that you have to look over and, and not please with or you, you don't want to claim. Have you ever did something in your life and people wasn't really pleased with you so they don't really talk about who you are because they don't really want to talk about it because you're always late? Amen. You know, this person always late on the job. I can't, you know, well, I ain't going to mention them. They do good work, but they don't get here on time. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you got a beautiful, you know, you got a beautiful voice and all. You're good and all, but I can't count on you for being here. Mm-hmm. See, it says do everything, everything with this type of diligence and attitude. To represent the kingdom of God. It says no matter whatever you do that's worth doing in the Lord's service is worth doing with enthusiasm and care. I can keep reading this all day and keep carrying this on and on because it hits all of us. I ain't say y'all, I say us because I got issues too. Because there are things each and every one of us do that's not pleasing to God according to what you're doing. We lack zeal. And, and, and we lack this zeal for, for, for the kingdom. We lack zeal in our lives, period. Half do things. You, you, and then we all understand people who cook. Sometimes you be cooking and you, as you say, you throw something together. See, I throw something together. But then sometimes I put all my, put my foot in it. I do all the good stuff to it and add all the spices to it and put the little paprika on the side of it there, the little, little plant right there and, and dress the little plate up. But then other times, you're going to stick something in a plate and stick it on a paper plate and slide it to me. It says, at all times, have that type of attitude. I want that plate that look pretty all the time. Well, here's the deal. Here's the deal. Jesus told his disciples that he must work the works of him who sent me while it's day. The night is coming when no one can work. John 9 and 3. Now, here's the deal with what he's telling you. Listen again. Jesus answered, neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God should be revealed in him. Huh. What he's saying is this. Do due diligence and do the work while you can, while you are allowed to be able to do it. Because when you time up, ain't no need talking about a do over. He says, while you're capable, while you're able, he said, you got to do the works of him who sent me. See, Jesus said, I came to do the work of Christ, and I'm doing them in a fashion that's pleasing unto him. He wants us to do the same thing as representatives of the kingdom of God. Amen. See, what, I mean, wouldn't it be disappointing to tell people that, 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 that your family, that your child or your favorite child or this is your son, but this son stays in the busted paper and it robbed every store in the city? Would you, would, you, would you be disappointed if that happened? I ain't say would you stop loving him, but wouldn't you be disappointed in him? Wouldn't you be disappointed in every time you came home, every electronic you had would be stolen and sold? Wouldn't that disappoint you? He says, do, do the work while you are able to do it. He's putting a time limit on it because he says, you're not always going to be able to do right. You're going to get old and going to get feeble and can't do it. That's one of the bad issues that we have as believers now because a lot of us come to Christ at an old age and all your zeal is burnt up. You gave the devil all the best life. You've been in the clubs turning it up for what? And then you're sitting here, you can't even raise holy hands. Say, raise your hands and you like this right here. But you was in a club like this. Turn it up. Turn it up. Now you can't raise your hands that high for the lower. We waste it. We're wasting. Paul wants us to understand we got to give. We got to give back. We got to we got to give to him while we're able to do it. When you, when 
there are some soldiers that has gone on and has been in the church from day one and they were diligent in their studies and they were diligent in their works and you understand when you see them little old ladies and little old men when they go they went out swinging they went out with a song on their heart praising they prayer warriors that's what he's talking about that's what he's looking for us to be listen to this right here the apostle paul he admonishes believers in the galatian churches he admonishes believers in the galatian churches now you understand what was going on in the galatian churches because we dealt with the book of galatians galatia was actually being infected by the outside sanhedrin it was actually infected by other cultures trying to disrupt who they were so what happened is if you remember the text they had been presented with the gospel he had taught them well but they kept falling out of communion or having issues in galatians 6 and 10 listen to what basically listen what, listen what paul is talking about he says therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all especially to those who are the household of faith yeah. hold it right there you that, that, that strike a chord it should strike you right there because you should look at it and shouldn't try to run through it because it starts off with a therefore with a comma therefore because of what has taken place and what we've been dealing with and what I know now as we have opportunity because now I've been taught about brotherly love because now I know how I'm supposed to treat my brethren therefore because I know this as I have opportunity now that means when I get a chance now let us do good to all that means now because I know better when I see those who are in need and in help that's my opportunity to step in and help see when I find somebody who's who's down in their spirit and it ain't always about money I've said that before but money is part of it God used money he created money and he uses money but that's not the concept of the issue sometimes people spiritual are spiritual bankrupt sometimes they need to hear an encouraging word from the Lord from you their best friend instead of going along with them in their foolishness they need you to reel them back in and explain to them what thus says the Lord in a loving manner he says therefore as we have opportunity let us do good to all mm. now first he says to all that means is your reputation as a human do good to everybody he says, I'm not even talking about the household yet. I'm talking about walking and talking in a manner that's pleasing unto the Lord. See, your reputation precedes you in a way that you don't do good to everybody or you do good to everybody. Some folks are known that they are help and they do good to people. And then there are some people who are known not to deal with, not to fool with. Doing good means doing good works. Sometimes good works involve sharing the gospel, sharing the word, sharing a ride, sharing a dollar. It says doing good to all. And then he comes along. He says, and I know you're doing good for everybody, but especially to those who are the household of faith. Now he's talking about your brethren. And when we say brethren, when we say brethren we mean those who are born again who are of the family of God so it says you do good to everybody but especially to your brethren yes. what scripture says how, 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 how can you call me brother and don't and then don't live and don't love the one that's sitting in front of you how can we talk about outreaching and loving the world and you sitting here across the pew from somebody that you got out with how can you be mad with the brothers in the church over some trivial madness because most of the time what you're mad about in here ain't ain't worth talking about yes. and because we won't come in here and sit down and, and understanding how to deal with these arts and get rid of them we let them linger on like a bad disease like a cancer and it eats away at the fiber of christianity yeah. see we mad because what somebody say somebody said you know that's play on words what somebody say what somebody said I should have wrote that down we get mad over that and instead of doing what scripture teaches us about going to your brother and talk to him and find out did I offend you 
Did I say something that was offensive? Excuse me of my language because I may not have expressed it the correct way, but I didn't mean this by all. Oh, this is what I was saying. But instead, we try to dodge it and think this old adage is going to work that time heals all wounds and time doesn't heal all wounds. Amen. Time just brushes up under the carpet. You know, if you sweep dirt up under the carpet, dirt going to stay up under the carpet. If you clean up and you sweep that dirt on your carpet, you know that dirt ain't going to go nowhere. I don't care how long, how many years you wait, that dirt ain't going nowhere. Time doesn't heal the wound. Believe that, believe that. So he's teaching us, he's showing us. He's saying in Galatians 6 and 10, especially to the household of faith. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 13, he admonishes us again. Paul says this, but as for you, Brethren, do not grow weary in doing good. Mm. I like the way he separated that and how Paul wrote that because it's, it's, got, it's got a catch to it. And watch what he says. But, when you see but, understand but is a counsel word. It's a counselation to counsel out what was going on before and it's bringing something new to you. So when he says but, it counsels out what happened before. And he says, as for you, brethren, he claimed he told you who you are. See, he's talking to the brothers, those who are the household of faith. When you see brethren, that means we are of like kind. Brethren of like kind, that means we are Christians. So brethren, do not grow weary. Don't, don't get tired in doing good. Don't, 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 don't let good bog you down. Don't, don't, get, don't, let, don't let good wear you down. See, here's the issue. A lot of people try to call it burnout. It bur we, we get burnout when we're operating on our own. See, only, you can only grow weary when you're operating outside of the supernatural kingdom. When you're doing it on your own, you get tired of doing it. Have you ever been helping somebody on your own with your own strength and you'll say these words right here, I'm tired of doing that for him. Oh, I'm tired of helping him. But when you praying and you trust in God and letting him lead you into doing good, you can't get weary because you're just doing what he asked you to do. Amen. God said, help him today, you help him today. If he don't tell you to help him tomorrow, then they don't get help tomorrow. And when you help them, you make sure you tell them where the help is coming from because it ain't from you. You're just the instrument that God used. Make sure you understand when you do help people, you make sure you understand that God gets the glory out of it. Amen. Remove yourself totally out of the picture and let God be the, let God be the one to gain all glory out of this. Yeah. I bought gas today. I had to get some gas today on the way to church. And um, there was a gentleman standing there. And I don't seen him a bunch of times at the service station. Ain't you know? So what? And he said, he said, um, he said, he said, hey, bro, can you? I mean, I I need to get something. Can you help me? And I helped him, and I say, God bless you. He said, and bless you too, brother. God bless you too. See, you make sure you get God in the mix of your work. It ain't you, cause I don't, them, them them dollars that I gave him. That's where they came from. I was just being a steward over whatever he gave me. Yeah. See. I'm just a steward of what he gave, and God will operate through stewards when you're doing his work and doing his work, not your work. Amen. See, when you're doing it yourself, you out of his will, and what you're doing is what you're doing. Yeah. I talked one time about the different types of giving, alms giving and, and tithes giving. I think we need to revisit that sometimes so we can understand how to help people and what we're really doing. See, one giving is just loaning the God. He give you back what you gave. Then there's another giving that he multiplies when you do. Amen. Then there's your tithing that you give to the kingdom. I think we should, I think we have to revisit that. And people don't like to talk about giving in church, but giving is a part of church. Yeah. Giving is one of the most important parts of church. We're not sitting in caves anymore. Y'all know y'all wouldn't like us to come to your living room and sit in there with you. And wear your good furniture out and break your chairs up and tear your house up, would you? Especially when you now, now, now y'all seen sometimes when New Horizon get the rock in there, how the choir be tanned up in here. You wouldn't want these folks on your furniture, would you? These jokers get in here and get crunk up sometime and they'll tear a house up. For those who've been with us a long time, you know we've went to other churches and we tore up their stuff. You know, they were like, oh Lord, you know, back them days, you know. Ooh, that choir used to be off the chain. Yeah. I miss those days, but I know God's going to restore those days. 
I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it because I know what he's going to bring is going to be better than what we had. So I ain't worried about that. But here's the deal. Like he says, be careful. Allow God to lead you. Follow his leadership. God is never a co-pilot. God is the pilot in your life. If he's your co-pilot, then you're in trouble because he ain't following you. He's going to sit there and watch you, but he ain't going to follow you. And matter of fact, he's going to get the parachute and jump on out the plane because he knows you're going to crash it. Well, not only that, he moves a little further, and here's the next thing he says. The text says, the text comes along and says, the word slothful, as used in the, New, in the King James Version, it means slow. It means lazy. It means delaying, hesitating, or pathetic. You hear that? You hear them words? I'm going to read them slow to you one more time because I think you need to get them. In the New King James Version, the word slothful was used, and it means slow, lazy, delaying, hesitating, or apathetic. See, in other words, it means not holding back, not dragging one's feet, not reluctant. When it says don't be slothful, it says not holding back, giving it your all. How many times have we, we, we've given back to the Lord? Because all that we do is to the Lord. We've discussed that earlier. So everything that a believer does is to the Lord. We give to the Lord. So how many times have you not given the Lord that 110%? When you just gave him 49%, 38%, 17%, and then we like to use our favorite cop out that the Lord knows my heart. You know, that's our favorite cop out. The Lord knows my heart. If he knew your heart, then you wouldn't have no problem. If he knew your heart, you would do it because out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth speak and you work. So don't say it. He knows my heart. That's, that's, that's one of our favorite cop outs we like to use. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. He says it means not holding back, not dragging one's feet, not reluctant. In other words, it's not going on and doing it, not procrastinating, not, not, not saying I'm going to do it and don't do it. That means when I do it, I don't do it with the zeal and the fervor that I should do it in. Have you ever asked somebody to, 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 to do something for you and they take all day to do it or do it when they get ready, and then when they do it, they have to do it? Not acceptable in their duties. Don't want to do it or want to do it when they want to. This is what the, new, this is what the King James Version is talking about when you hear the word slothful. If you ever saw that commercial about that animal, the sloth. If you notice that sloth in the tree, he moves so slow you can't even tell he's moving. Lord, help my slothfulness. That means I ain't even moving. That's a person that's slow. And we blame it on slothfulness, but Paul said it's really us. He said it, it, sloth is the animal, but we're sloth because we're lacking diligence. We're not, we're not applying ourselves. We're not doing it as we're doing it to the Lord. I guarantee you, if the law was, if we had to deal with the law every day, actually saw him and had to do things actually for him, I guarantee you wouldn't be a late joker in here. The law was standing in this poor pit on Sunday morning, I guarantee you it wouldn't be a late person in here. We have to get back to the idea that all that we're doing, we're doing to the Lord. It looked like we're doing it for a man, but we're really not. Because God is in charge of everything and all things, so that means he's in charge of that. So he says, this slothfulness, this dragging one's feet, it means to feel loath or to be slow or to hesitate to be lazy. Now, listen to this. Hesitate to be lazy. Isn't that something? How can you be slow at being lazy? That's a double negative. That means you dragging your feet doing nothing. Some people say good for nothing. Ain't that something? King James Version. King James Version uses slothful. Listen to this. The point behind the word slothful focuses on the simple idea of just plain laziness. Plain out laziness. You can't blame any other reason. It's just laziness. And that's the issue. Paul is telling us, be not Slothful in business. 
be not lazy in your business. The first of the three phases found here in verse 11 is that Paul declares not lagging in diligence in verse 11a. So in order that we might understand this phrase, it's necessary that at how it's, it's presented in other translations. It's how it's, it's how it's presented to us, how the writer presents the writing to us. The King James Version actually reads, not slothful in business. The NIV reads, never be lacking in zeal. The Living Bible reads, never be lazy in your work. And the New Revised Standard verse reads, do not lag in zeal. A more literal meaning of these variation translations would be this. In regard to what you ought to be doing, don't be lazy. You hear that? In regard to what you ought to be doing, don't be lazy. In other words, here's the task, the, 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 the duties that you have, don't be lazy on them. We ought to, we, having zeal for what, what you're called to do or what you do is the issue. It says, don't be lazy in what you're called to do. See, this is directed against the, the weariness and well-doing. This is what it means. And it's stated by the Apostle Paul in Galatians 6 and 9. And Galatians 6 and 9 states this right here. It says, and let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Huh. Think about it. It says, let us not grow weary in wrongdoing. He's telling us why don't grow weary in wrongdoing. Because it says, in due season we, we shall reap if we do not lose heart. It didn't say we might reap. It says we shall reap. It gives us a definite of what's going to happen if you don't lose heart. It didn't say if you hang on, just hang on, it's going to get better. No, no, no. It says you will reap for doing good if you don't lose heart. See, it's basically, it's basically understanding or basically what it's letting us understand here is this. It says being weary in well-doing only affects, you only, only are weary when this happens to you, when you lose heart. Now, here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal, here's the deal. Christians must understand that, that, that it's, a, it's a real problem when trying to, 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 to live Christian life for any length of time. It's a real problem. If you've been a Christian for any, any length of time, that can be a problem for you. That, that, that gets to be a problem. The words, the words of the world on a Christian's shoulders sometimes causes him to kind of stumble. It's, it's kind of hard. If, you've been in, if, 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 if you're in the kingdom of God, if you belong to God, you know that there are some things that just come at you and, and, and in your old life you would have like, you wouldn't even experience it. When you were where you used to be and who you used to be, them, those pressures didn't come at you like that. So here's the deal. Here's the deal. Since we're trying to live a Christian life for any length of time, it's a real problem. This means that it's very easy to get discouraged. I think Christians go through depression or, or from discouragement more than anything. And what I mean is this. You understand when you're doing right by God, you're doing everything you're supposed to, you're paying tithes, you're coming to all three services, you're praying, and you're doing everything you, 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 know, you know to do that God has instructed you to do. But then testing comes and trials come and discourage you. you like, I didn't have these problems when I was in the world. When I was, when I was, when I was living like the heathens in the world, I, I didn't have these issues. I didn't even know what these kind of problems were. You get discouraged from doing it. Not only that, you got family, you got friends that help out in discouraging you know, and it's amazing. And believers, get it now, brethren are some of the biggest discouragers it is. They are some of the main ones that will tell you what not to do. If I were you, girl, I, I ain't going to church today. I'm tired. I've been there enough today. We were having an evening service, and, and you couldn't get a, you couldn't pay a joker to come in here. And why? Because they say, oh, I, I have been here before. And, 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 we, and I remember one time we committed. He asked how many was coming. 
and everybody raised their hand like they were going to come. And then when that evening came, you could throw a rock and not hit nobody in here. Because one will say, I ain't coming back, honey. I've been there enough today. I'm going to get something to eat. I'm going to lay down. And, and we discourage each other. We never seem to uplift each other. We never seem to, to stick and tell each other, come on back. It's probably going to be a word for you today. I need to hear what he's going to say today, what the God, Lord got for me today. We never share that. We just, just, just keep on being a discouragement or being discouraged, and it holds us back. See, it says, in fact, it's very hard to maintain a steady, constant flow or a daily walk as a believer. It's hard to do it. A believer seems like we get, we get attacks from all over. You talk about you. If, if you got a job, you can imagine some of the problems you have to go through in the secular world. I mean, you got people that will come at you and you'd be like, Lord, if I wasn't saved, if I was an old me, I would just, I just tell, I, I get you off of my back. You know, you, you know, you know how it is. And, and, and you know how you say they just doing that because they know I'm a Christian. They trying me because I'm a Christian. When I was in the world, they didn't come at me like that. They know I didn't play that. Oh, they broke in my house because they know, they, know they know I can't do what I used to do. You know, and, and, it's, and it's amazing, but that's, that, those are some of the things. It's just a hard walk some, sometimes. Not all the times. It's a hard walk because devil actually tries you. He actually comes after you. And the thing of it is, and the issue is, is you have to understand is God allows the testing because he empowers you to go through the testing. He don't allow you to take a test because you can't pass it. Well, he, he gives you the answer for the test, and he watches you pass the test. He's looking for you to pass it because he's empowered you with everything you need to pass this test. So it says testings and trials, they kind of they they discourage us sometimes. Been doing good, been doing everything I was supposed to, and then the doctor gave me a bad report on my health. I got diabetes. I'm sick. I'm, I'm, I'm falling apart. All of these issues, those things we have to deal with, those are things we have to look at. But listen to this. This is not, this is not to encourage us not to try at all, but we must seek to do our best at all times. Christians, listen closely. We don't say it a lot today, but I need you to hear this. Although discouragement comes and we know trials are going to come our ways, but we are to do our best. Put your best forward. The Lord know what you can take. He know how much you can stand. He, he equipped you to do what you're doing. So he know what he gave you equipment for. And when he gets past or when your problems get past your equipping, he'll step in. Yeah. If you do your best to stand. Stand Use your best to stand, and I guarantee you, when the load gets that heavy and you can't stand, he'll show up and put his arms up under you. You got to remember that. You got to live that way. So, Christians, you got to develop a spirit of diligence, which is a deliberate, calculated effort to accomplish tasks. Listen again. Christians must develop a spirit of diligence. You notice the word I use here is develop. You got to work on it. You got to work on your diligence. None of us came in the same way. And none of us are at the same point. We all had to work on it. Just like a muscle, a bodybuilder, his muscles didn't just grow big. He got big muscles by working his muscles. We have to work our diligence for our diligence to grow. That's what the text is saying. Of course, you know I would love to go further, but I do not have the time. But I enjoy this text. I enjoy this text of teaching, and we got a lot more to deal with. The main thing I want us to understand is says Christians must develop a spiritual life of diligence, a spirit of diligence. I'm gonna drop you off at that point. We'll be back next week where we'll go a little further in verse 11 of Romans chapter 12. I pray that this week could be a profitable week for you. I pray that God's protection is encompasses you and, and, and wraps itself around you. And if anything, if anything you've heard today, I pray that you that you be, I pray that you be zealous in your work. Be zeal, have a new zeal towards God. Thank you, and I'll see you again next week. Amen.